cool. Your recording device is very cool. <laughs> I don't mean to get meta on people right away, but it's this little device and it has this wonderful microphone. <laughs> Hi, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <laughs> sorry. Hello, and welcome back to Radio DMG. I'm your host, Philip Wesley, the Mile High Mouth, and I'm here at Non Descon 2012 with. I'm also Philip. No, I'm not. I'm Chuck Huber. Chuck Huber. Chuck Huber. Hmm. So, Chuck Huber, who are you and what do you do? I am an Anunnaki citizen from the planet Nibiru, and I've come here to pole shift your universe. No, I'm a voice actor. I started uh, voice acting when I was four years old. No, 20? 24. Dragon Ball Z, Android 17, Garlic Jr., Emperor Pilaf. A uh, bunch of other characters on that. And then I did uh, Hiei and Yu Yu Hakusho, Dr. Stein and Soul Leader, Shao Tucker and Full Metal Alchemist, and lots of Austria in Hitalia, Hero in Shin Chan, something in Black Butler. I can't remember his name. Hmm. Gio? I don't know. It'll come back to me. Uh, yes. I'm an old man. Be nice. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, aside from voice acting, you also do a lot of writing and directing. Mm-hmm. I've done... Uh, uh, a bit of writing and directing. I wrote, in terms of anime, the first one I wrote all by myself. And when we say write, it's really script adapt, because you're adapting it from the Japanese translation. But the first one I wrote all by myself was Bakano. And it was fun because it was a period piece. So I got to find, I got to be searching on the internet for all like these, you know, sort of cool period ways of putting things that would also fit the flaps. And, uh, I also got to write on Sergeant Frog, which was probably one of my... And Italia. Italian Sergeant Frog I wrote with Jamie Markey, and she's a very, very funny woman. And she and I would just make each other laugh, trying to find funnier and funnier jokes to put in. Because it kind of let us go with Italia, because it's historical, and so we had to sort of hit things from an American perspective instead of a Japanese perspective, because the comedy's different. What different countries mean is different, so... Those two were really fun. Uh, and the directing I did a long time ago, recently I've been directing more film work and uh, have a movie and a web series that I'm a director of photography and assistant editor on that Brina Palencia is doing called The Troubadours. And uh, we just premiered uh, the latest episode, Hobbit Day, last night, mm. which is cool because it was very Lord of the Ringsy. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the other stuff that you've written, um, apparently you wrote something, helped co-write something called The Fragility of Seconds? Yes, that was a movie uh, we did. It was basically me and, me and two other friends, Matt Tompkins, Julio Cedillo, and we hopped in a van with some film equipment and drove to Mexico and made a movie. That's pretty much all the preparation we had was, let's just throw film equipment in a van and drive. And uh, it ended up winning top honors at the Houston International Film Festival, which was fun. And it's a fun bilingual uh, sort of border drama. And my, my character was Scottish. I, I thought it was fun to have a Scottish character because I thought it'd be fun to try to speak Spanish with a Scottish dialect. Donde está el centro? Hay que tomar un taxi. <laughs> and all the people in Mexico thought it was funny to hear me talk Spanish with a Scottish dialect. So I did that. And then I have another movie, uh, Arbor Day the Musical, which uh, Vic Mignon is in, Brina Palencia, Chris Sabat is, Okerchan's going to do the sound design once I finish the edit, which uh, Brina and uh, Paul are helping me on right now, sort of managing uh, the finish on the production side. And uh, it's a awesome. It's got lots of great music in it, singing and dancing. Mm. I noticed that you funded it with Kickstarter. Yes, uh, the last portion of it here has been funded by Kickstarter, and it's been, uh, it was amazing when the Kickstarter thing happened. It, it, uh, it's like an outpouring of, ooh, I just had a spit on the microphone, an outpouring of support and the, uh, I don't know, it's just good to have that backup. As an artist, you don't have people rooting for you when you're, trying to make it to the next job, you know. So getting to have people behind you is really important. Mm -hmm. um, Arbor Day the Musical has an interesting backstory to it. Um, would you care to elaborate on it? Yeah, it's a music, it's about a director putting on a theatrical musical. It's a, a, a 
uh, and the musical he's doing is about September 11th. So it's essentially a September 11th musical comedy, which most people think, that's, you can't do that. And that's exactly why I want to do it, because people say you can't do that. And I have a friend who, when the idea came to me, I had a friend who uh, lost someone in September 11th. Her, her dad was killed at the Pentagon. So... I thought if I could pitch this movie to her, I couldn't approach all the victims' families, but I thought if I could pitch this movie to her and have her, she didn't necessarily have to buy into everything, but just the idea of that, a movie that sort of takes the myth of that day and tries to shred it down a little so it's not such a powerful, you know, tool for politicians or the media or government or whatever. And so I went to her dad's grave uh, and then to the Pentagon with her, and she showed me, walked me through her day, that day and the next day, when her, her father died. And after she told me the whole story and went through the whole thing, then it was time for my pitch. <laughs> and it was the, the most nervous I've been giving a pitch in my entire life. But she loved it, she loved the idea of it, and so that's when I decided to do it. Actually, then I had a, a massive heart attack the next day and a quintuple bypass surgery. So it was another three months before I started filming. Hmm. Um, was it difficult to get people to uh, be in this? Yeah, there was some resistance and we had one, you know, a couple people quit. And But the more I, the more I involved other artists, the more I said this is... I don't want to be a tool. I want to use you as a tool to sell some agenda. I just want to speak the truth about whatever it is you want to say about it. Because the the movie mirrored the stage play that the director was doing in the in the movie, in that people were confused and hurt, and there's conflicted feelings, and you know. Uh, and I said that's just part of it. I said I think we need to show that, and so we did. And got some really amazing stuff really amazing scenes I can't wait to get finished with it it's so close I was supposed to be finished by now but my um, now that I have backup now that I have people managing me I'm, I'm married and I have six kids and I'm a, a self-contracting artist at, 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 and I'm not very good managing myself so it's good to have people backing you up hmm. speaking about managing yourself um you seem to be very, very busy. How do you find the time to um, spend your time on your work and with your family? Well, they miss me sometimes. There's there's seasons of my career. I mean, after prior to Arbor Day and the heart attack, I had been doing more corporate things to fill the gap, like corporate training and was doing a lot of the script writing, which you can carry with you anywhere. And after the heart attack, I just decided that I would go full steam into just being a producer and a director and now an editor and a director of photography and it's taken it's this will be two years this December and it's taken me about it took me about 18 19 months to even get myself back into uh, that side of the business but now things are picking up and things are looking so my family's missed me a lot and they've been very patient uh, but now that things are picking up they'll get to see me more often mm -hmm. and I see I'd, I'd see him almost every day and it, it, we do attachment parenting so the kids are always in the bed with us there's like a typical thing is to wake up in the morning and everybody's just sitting in the bed you know telling talking about what they're going to do that day or you know whatever the youngest is one she sleeps in the bed with us so I get to hang she's the one it's important for me to like keep a connection with her so because mm -hmm. otherwise they get scared Who's the scary man with the beard? <laughs> when I went to Africa, I came back, and Sophia, or was it Max? I can't remember. I think it was Max. Didn't recognize me and started screaming, because I'd been gone for like six weeks. Oh, goodness. And it was an important six weeks. But then, he, he, you know, they get over it. Mm -hmm. So, with six kids, um, how do you come up with so many names for them? Do you just kind of eventually just start naming them after stuff in the room? That's the right. Clamp? This is... This is water bottle over there. It's power strip. <laughs> Blanket. Blanket. Now, uh, Kirsten does most of the naming. Well, we kick... Usually when she's pregnant, we kick ideas back and forth. Like, I wanted Juliet. Did you get Juliet? No, she wanted Juliet. I wanted Juliet's name. I was fighting for Artemis. Uh -huh. 
and she she nixed it. I wanted to name her Artemis. I didn't even get it as a middle name. Oh. oh. But Juliet Artemis just kind of sounded weird, so she's Juliet Diane. So yeah. No. None of that, actually. It's good. I, yeah, it's good. I mean, just, Juliet's a beautiful... Uh, Juliet's perfect for it. I couldn't... But if we have another, it's Artemis. You've heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. So, um, going back to uh, Arbor Day, the musical, and um, your heart attack, do um, mm-hmm. you feel your outlook on life changed a little after that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Even my kids noticed it. My son, Gabriel, who's the sweet little teddy bear of a kid... Um, came up to me and said, I don't want to hurt your feelings, Dad, but I like you better after the heart attack. And I was like, doesn't it? No, you're not telling me anything I don't agree with because uh, it slows you down. Uh, it makes you... Like, physically, I could not get upset or anxious for, like, the first two months. Because if I did, I could feel it. You can literally feel it in your heart. Um, so, and And now that I'm you know, healthy and, and running around like a madman. Um, things, you know, things recede back to something sort of normal or what you, but you carry with you, hopefully, enough seed of the changes that you, you know, keep nurturing them and growing in that change. I'd say I'm less uh, worried about where I'm going or what's happening next and way more just concerned with what's right in front of me instead of worrying about the past or the future. Mm-hmm. Past makes you depressed and the future makes you anxious. Mm. So the now is the best place to be. Best place to be. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the place where you are, um, what do you think of Nondescon so far? It's amazing. It's a really excellent convention. A lot of people told me it was excellent, but it, it, doing I've been doing conventions now for, I don't know how long, 10 years, and... Uh, uh, the newer cons, when they're getting... it's a, I mean, the... The complications of organizing something like a convention, especially an anime convention. I mean, you got the dealers' rooms, you got tables, you got artist alley, you got contests, you got judges, you got people wanting press interviews, you got registration, you got food, you got hotel bills, you got cars, you got. I mean, there's so much that has to be done. Security, walkie-talkies, and you know, just goes on and on. So for the 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 staff to have things so well organized. I mean, like, you walk in to your room the first day and there's a book. And you open the book and it tells you everything that's happening. It tells mm-hmm. you when you're supposed to be where and, you know, gives you all the numbers. You get everything in one nice little book. And it's like, this is really cool. And then the fans here are really cool, too. We were, we were remarking, we're like, there are the prettiest people here. This is like the con with the prettiest people. I don't know what the deal is. It's Denver. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Is it the oh, Denver vibe? People live here or move here? I think it's the altitude makes you prettier or younger or something. It's also that um, it's a little bit more difficult to breathe around here. I think it's one of the healthier cities too. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. It might be. It's a very clean city too. We're like this place is so clean. It works. It works out for us and such. Yep. Mm. So um. We, you've written several different types of stories and such. Um, which do you find easier to write, um, drama or comedy? Um, cool. I think they're both equally as hard. Mm. I mean, I wrote a monologue for Arbor Day the Musical that I was very proud of. But I don't feel like I really have a right to be proud of it because I wrote it in maybe... It's like a four-page monologue, like a four-minute monologue, and I wrote it in maybe 11 minutes. You know, it just came out of me, and I just wrote it. And so some of those things you're not even in control of or in charge of, and those are nice. And that can happen with comedy or with drama. When you get stuck with drama, it's easier to fix that on set or with camera. I mean, it's easier to let the director or the actors fix sort of a dramatic moment. You need the narrative well-crafted. But comedy, writing comedy, I think the the key is having lots of people look at it, and if, if they think, if, if everybody thinks something's funny, then it's funny. And so you're like, okay, that joke works. Um, 
writing in isolation is, I think, probably the hardest thing. Having being able to write and show it to other people and have them change it and adapt it is the easiest, whether it's comedy or drama. Uh, that said, I think I like writing drama better, but it, I always try to find things that are funny in it too. So, mm-hmm. and crowdsourcing it essentially um, right. with other people tends to uh, eliminate a lot of problems many writers have with writer's block. Right. Would you say so? Yeah. As a matter of fact, we're writing a uh, a web series for the Georgia Department of Education and. I was doing the first draft of the episode summaries, and so trying to get the narrative out. And I, I emailed Brina, and I said, I need help with this. And literally, all I needed was for her to sit on the phone with me for 45 minutes. And I'd, I'd pitch her an idea and say, okay, this kid has to have trouble in class. He's not getting along with his teacher. There's a problem. The mother's upset about it. What's the problem? What's the issue? And so we kick ideas back and forth. And you always know when, because someone will start with an idea and flip it back to you, and you flip it to them. And then during one of the flips, it's like you both go, aha, that's it. That's the one we want to use. And we did that on like three different plot points. It took like 45 minutes, and I was off to the races again. But I'd been stuck on those three problems for like four days. Well, what is the um, a film about? It's called Modern Teachers, and it's a... it's about teachers in Georgia and the, the Department of Education wanted to do it to, uh, to sort of promote their ideas or their initiatives which we essentially uh, will script within the narrative will sort of address those issues because they want to do like round table meetings with parents to talk about the different issues that the webisode sort of mm. touches on mm-hmm. so it's a, like a narrative way of approaching a topic which is really smart of them. Hmm. So, um, well, I have a quick question about the Troubadours. Um, sure. Where did the inspiration for that come from? That was Haley and Brina. I think it started with Brina's Kagura video, where she mm-hmm. roasted Chris Sabat as Kagura seven twenty seven four, whatever her name is. And so it started with that, and I think Haley Esposito, her partner, had um, another idea, and so it was their it's their baby. They brought me on to shoot the first episode and subsequent episodes after that as the director of photography uh, and I'm, I'm pretty good as a DP but we've gotten professional DPs since then to make things uh, look even better I learned enough being a DP so that it'll make me a better communicator to DPs when I'm, a, when I'm directing because I'll be able to mm-hmm. understand what the camera does and what I'm asking them to do and uh, where I found the most fun was in editing, getting to edit some of the episodes uh, and try to fix some of my mistakes creatively, uh, camera mistakes, and then also as we got better and better, seeing how the edit became easier and easier and allowed us to stretch the sort of uh, color uh, effects or, or actual effects or sound uh, effects further and further which is for we're getting better. We keep getting better as a team, which is... I was saying that, you know, I used to think that I wanted my talent to be better than everybody else's, but you get to a point where the only way your talent will be, get any more usefulness out of it is by being surrounded by people who are more talented than you. Mm. And that's... We all have gifts, but everybody is, you know... Being surrounded with a team of talented people is really amazing. Mm. It's a lot of fun. Speaking about being surrounded by people, um, I have a question about a well, an earlier answer that you gave me. Um, why attachment parenting? Um, attachment parenting is basically it's vintage parenting. It's antique parenting. It's um, it's just about keeping the child close to your body for as long as possible. And the I mean, I didn't do any of this. This is all my wife. Uh, Kirsten's the smart one, and I just defer to her opinion or read the books she's reading she'll give me a book to read but like a great way of describing it is that when you sleep with a baby in the bed and people always say aren't you afraid you're going to crush the baby or roll over on the baby and kill the baby no and I think if you were like a uh, you know horrible alcoholic you probably shouldn't sleep with the baby because you will be drunk and something bad will happen but you're very sensitive to where they are and actually they've found that because you have the baby in the bed with you, we don't have to wake up for feedings. We just stay asleep. 
you know, mom just rolls over and nurses the baby and everybody stays asleep. Baby stays asleep, I stay asleep, she stays asleep. And then the other thing it does is you are right there if they get sick, if anything happens. And SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, happens a great proportion less in um, families that do family bed or attachment parenting because you're constantly connected to the baby. And yeah, you, you like any two people who are in the same bed, you nudge each other or touch each other, so you're constantly aware of the other person's, you know, life. Are any of the kids in school, and do you do an all, a different kind of schooling than public school? Yeah, we do homeschooling, and we have part of a homeschool co-op, and it's like all day Thursday, and Kirsten takes them to the home, and this is new this year. She had been doing, and I had been doing the lessons the previous years, uh, but with the homeschool co-op, we don't have to plan anything. We don't have to grade anything. All we got to do is help with homework. So they get all their lessons for the week. Plus, they have other things with church and, and other art organizations that they do outside of the home. But yeah, so every Thursday they go and get their stuff. Do they use a Becca, Bob Jones, or Saxon? Uh, Saxon, definitely. Uh, Saxon's one of my favorites. Like yes. Uh, I, I was a principal of a school for six years as well, mm. and a teacher. And we use Saxon. I'm familiar with the Abeka curriculum. Uh, the, and I think some of this may be Abeka, or what's the other one? Excellence in Writing? Yeah. Then I think it's that, Excellence in Writing. Bob Jones. And Bob Jones, yeah. yeah. I'm not familiar with the Bob Jones one. But uh, the uh, uh, my favorite thing about homeschooling is just that it's... It's so much less stressful, less work, less drama, drama less... You have to yeah. worry less about bullying. <laughs> yeah, you don't have yeah. to worry about any of that because your your kids are... And people worry about socialization. And yeah, you, you can't... Our kids will tell us if they've been in the house too long mm -hmm. and they need their friends. But, you know, I mean, high school and junior high, the only place that environment ever exists again in life is in prison. You know, I mean, like, the the giant public high schools and public junior highs are, you know, it's a very, it can be a very scary place for kids, and it's because it's not a natural system. It's not natural to separate people by their age. That's the only place we separate people by age is in these schools, because it's more natural for children to be around adults sometimes, or older kids, or younger kids, and that way you have to you know, adjust to all of humanity, but when you lord of the flies everyone in a single class and you're, you know, cohesive in that way, it becomes... Uh, it really doesn't set you up for the real world. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's, if it does, some, I've been in some office environments that remind me of a high school, mm. and I don't like those either. But that's because they don't know other, any other way to, to work it. You know, the managers are the teachers, and the workers are the students, and there's cliques and all that, and... You know, that's just not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, going back to that socialization and such, um, there's a question we do ask a lot of guests, and I'm going to ask you this one here. Um, I've noticed at conventions there's a lot of energy that people tend to have. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a, yeah, there's a lot of energy that people tend to have at uh, conventions. You see, you see them running around doing all sorts of stuff, but um, when they get out of the conventions, they tend to clam up or just go into a bit of a shell. Is there any advice that you could give our listeners about how to avoid shelling up? Uh, just to be a good friend. I always say, you know, you may, you may want to be friends with someone, uh, but the best way to have a friend or a group of friends is to be a good friend. So you may see someone who needs a good friend, and then you be that good friend and then suddenly you're surrounded by friends and it, it's not about being accepted into one group or another you you have all the power yourself right now you just start find someone who needs a friend and be their friend and suddenly you have friends it's very simple every but there's always people who want friends every, I, I want friends i mean we all want friends we, even when you get older you have friends move away and and then you don't have that thing you used to have because they live in seattle or whatever now and and so then you want to develop new friends, and I mean it doesn't it doesn't ever stop. I'm sure as we get older, we'll still have to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's it for for right now. I'm I'm Philip Wesley, the Mahai Mouth, um, and uh, my guest has been Chuck Huber. 
And um, did you have anything else to say before I say good night? Spatula. Spatula. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, good night. Good night.